Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. All right. Anything, any additional, you know, again, focusing on habitat, you've, you've got your CP25 planted, you've been grooming it and cutting it, it's established. Um, what now? What am I going to look at for additional habitat or to add to that, to hold up? Well, the only thing I'd say is if, if, if the field, if maybe it's a pollinator field, you don't necessarily need to do this with CP25, but if those, if it does get ragged in the fall and you're a guy who can't stand seeing that stuff, there's nothing wrong with mowing it one more time the next spring. As soon as it gets up to your knee, 10 inches, and then, and then you're done. And you kind of clean it. I don't, I don't say clean up, but, but you know, you make it so you, you, you're not as worried about the weeds. You're still going to go through periods of there being the second year and third year where mare's tail shows up. I get more calls on that than I do, you know, this damn mare's tail is driving me nuts. Just, it, it'll go away. Just got to go in, take a, have a cup of coffee, take a deep breath, and just wait it out. It's an annual plant, but I always thought it was a biennial because it forms a rosette in the fall and then comes up the next the next spring. But mare's tail can be, you know, because we hear about it as being, you know, Roundup doesn't affect it as much and all that stuff. It's actually more because we're actually mowing and and we're letting forbs come up hmm. and that mare's tail's getting light and 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 it's showing up a lot more. But there's nothing wrong with it. It's it's not going to destroy your planning. You just some stuff you got to just live with as it co- continues to mature. Okay, all right. So you got your planning done. Yeah. And you and and maybe you've gone out the next spring and you've actually mowed it once the next spring. Yeah. You know your next big event is going to be a burn. And this is another. I won't say this is absolute fact, but I tell people now, if you're not going to burn that prairie or that planting, that native planting, I don't plant it. Because they don't work. It might be there for 10 years, but it ain't going to be there much longer than that. you you got to burn, and we have to rethink our whole attitude towards fire. Because the other thing that I'm seeing, as we get even more diverse in CP25s and these pollinator plots, we've got to think about the time of year that we're, that we're burning. We've always burned to distress or try to knock back brome or cool season non-natives. And a lot of times that's May 1st. You know, you're letting it get up and grow well, and then you're going to go in and cook that thing and get rid of that stuff. That's fine, but it's not good for Forbes. I actually, I have actually done a um, couple of what we call growing season burns or summer burns. And as I do those and see the, see the impact of them, we just need to think it's not always May 1st. It's not always late April. I think we move up in southern Iowa, I would think like April 1st, where you're burning and what you're get, what you're promoting is the forbs out there, the broadleaves, more so than the grasses. The grasses are always they're so hardy and they're always going to come. But we're working to try to keep that field diverse. The other thing is growing season burns is usually August. And I'll tell you, the first time I lit it, I thought this is going to be just a god awful day of watching stuff smolder. If it, if that's a little bit older older stand and there's dead material in there. It'll burn as if it's if it's low humidity, lower humidity. It's still gonna be, you know. <laughs> I was always got high humidity <laughs> for sake, when you're talking about fire. But uh, but if that humidity is a little low, it's amazing what you can do. And then and we do it on those fields where big blue stem has just started to, to dominate. And it's a field where you know you've got flowers in there. You, you know it was they were there, but it's just this dang big blue stem is just tending to dominate. An August burn can really do some good things. Now that's tough because you're losing hunting on, on that thing. But if, it's, if you're big enough and you can do a portion of it, there's nothing wrong with that. It, you you'll, will see an impact of more Forbes the next year and not as vigorous uh, big blue stem as, or switchgrass or, or Indian grass, whatever it may be. But that, those, so I'm thinking now that if I had a place, and if I was a manager, well, I'd, I'd not only be thinking about, you know, doing what I can do, but fire at different times of the year. Hmm. 
That's interesting. That's the first time I've really heard that. You know, so, all right. Uh, so in my mindset, you're going to convince me otherwise, I'm sure. In my mindset, big blue stem is great from a deer habitat yep. perspective. Yep. So by doing that August burn, do I impact, do I impact that deer habitat? Yeah. And you're going to impact pheasant habitat too. There's not going to be as good a hunt. Now it greens up, you know, you're going to have a nice green field that I'm not saying, I guess I haven't looked at it close enough, but I'm not saying the deer aren't going to love that fresh green field out there that fall. Mm -hmm. But you, it, you almost have to have enough acres where you're either will you got, you're willing to give up that fall to make it better overall, or you've got enough acres where you can do a portion of it like that, but you still got, you know, another 40 acres, 80 acres next to it that, that, that you don't have to touch. Matt, is this something that you would consider maybe doing a third of a field or a half yeah, a field yeah, and rotate yeah, it yeah. every so often? Yeah, yes. Okay. So yeah. now in NRCS, um, so in my program, so I have some CP42. Yeah. Uh, pollinator program. And so I'm in my mid con I'm in my mid contract management plan this year. Mm -hmm. I've got two fields. It's about six and a half acres, mm -hmm. and uh, so they want me to burn it all at once, all 100. percent But if I wanted to do, I don't know if if they'll let you do it. Yeah, that August burn. I don't yeah, know. that might be that might be something where I'm not saying we get away with stuff, but once we can show NRCS in the local area that what we're doing is is right and they believe in us. You take an example of some planting. Sometimes in the wintertime, they want you to drag a cultivar packer behind your spreader if you're just broadcast seeding. Sure. But if we go out there and show them that, all right, this is what we did on this field. It wasn't dragged. The freezing thawing is planting these seeds. Those folks will understand that that's okay. You know, so it might take some time to be able to do it. On the other hand, you don't have to plant it. You don't have to burn it in August. I'm not telling you to do that. No. I'm saying that in the in that 10 year or 20 year period, at some point you may 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 want to do it. I would tell you that this spring you get that done in early April at the most, at the latest. Yep. I'm on Even track March. for March actually. Yeah. Yep. Nothing wrong with that. And then you're really going to improve it. You care if I'm I'm going to jump back just a second. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't talk about it when we just talked about CP25, but the other thing that I think people need to know is that anytime you sign up for CRP, and I don't care if it's a straight mix of just three grasses or something like that, or if it's a pollinator mix, mm -hmm. you make sure you have a fire break around that field. Do not let them map that field out without a fire break. And the biggest reason for that is not the fire necessarily, it's because what we've got out in that CP25 field is great for a lot of birds, but that clover that you're putting in the fire break is, is also important and good for birds. Turkeys love it. Pheasant broods love it. Deer love it. And what I do is I have a fire break where I've got enough grasses in there to, to satisfy the standard in Iowa, but I load it up with clover so that if you mow it every August, which you can do mm -hmm. once a year, it's going to tend to stay in clover. And, you know, clover tends to fade out after four or five years. But if you mow it, you can keep that clover there. And, and it's everything from Ladino to like Alsike. You know, Alsike's there for the wetter sites or a little sour soil or somewhere where something else may not grow. But there's medium, a little bit of medium red, not, not so that it's going to take over. But you've got four or five different clovers. Then I got, you know, we were talking about it earlier, but food plots and, and deer hunters. So I get crazy at how much it costs and everything. So I just came up with a, just a, a deer browse mix, you know. And I'll get guys in southern Iowa that won't plant that as their whole food plot or fire break. But maybe there's a half an acre alongside the timber where they like know the deer come out. Well, you just, you don't even switch over. You just put that, that all clover mix in and just for a half acre, make it really nice. Sure. You know, basically more white clover in there and, and. You know, you kind of got a little bit of a green browse area though too, but it also with our with our bees. You know, the, the you know, honey bees graze on those flowers on C, CP twenty five, but it's not their favorite place to go. They like the not you know they're non native. They like the they, they like the non native stuff. They like regular clovers and and other 
other pollinators are, can be the same way or will utilize. So it's just giving you a, another group of plants out there for for uh, uh, pollinator species to to work on too. Yeah, no, yeah. that's what I've heard. I mean, I when I planted my CP forty two, I did not, I didn't consult anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was new. I was so excited sure. to get into the pollinator sure. program, and uh, I didn't put in fire breaks. And uh, so now I'm having to use alternative motives, you yeah. know, to to control that because uh, we've got a big burn, <laughs> big burn this this year, and I I mowed it last fall. Yeah. Uh, so uh, well, that's good. I mean, in those, you know, that 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 that's the thing too with fire breaks and and that and and burning. Uh, the, the the clover fire breaks. Clover is just more succulent. You, you know, I've done plenty of burns where the only thing we had was what was there, or they just left the old brome as the fire break. Sure. And you watch fire will just walk through that stuff. You know, it just works its way through. It's it's still pretty volatile, uh, but clover will stop it. It just seems that it's a little more moist or whatever the hell it is, it, or in the spring it's matted down and it stays wet or whatever. Um, it's it's a good stopper. For fire and you know it's just you're just gonna have more work on your hands when it yeah. comes to fire day yeah i'm gonna enlist my friends yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like there's nothing to take if you can find a rake and and rake it a couple times and always rake your stuff out not into the fire but out of the fire but if you know if you got a 30 foot fire break and if you got a 15 foot rake that somebody can dig out of the grove and say yeah you can use it that's one way to to help and, and you got to probably do it two or three times but you can get down to almost mineral soil without bothering the plants you're you're okay with that cool all right matt great great dialogue um anything in addition to uh cp well we're in cp25 we've been talking cp25 are there other programs we should talk so there's about? another program that i think honestly i i absolutely feel that we kind of hit a pinnacle it, and this crp program it's always been a fight for making sure that we're doing everything that we can for soil and for water and for wildlife. If you think about the program, those are the three big reasons that it's out there. And that's what we've got to show that we're doing. Uh, and, and so it's been, you know, it's been not tough, but it's been a, take some time for USDA to see these fields and evaluate them and know that they're doing their job and all the different. And, and, you know, as you look at Kansas and maybe the Dakotas and Nebraska, those are places that still had, when we started this whole program, had native prairie out there on the landscape. And in some places, you know, big chunks of it. And, and farmers still farmed and used native landscapes in their farming operations. What I'm saying is people understood what prairie was. If you think about it, when we brought switchgrass in back into the state of Iowa and started planting it, nobody knew what the heck it was. I mean, we pl- plowed everything up. It was all gone. And for you know for the most part and and so it was coming in you see that as we go east you know ohio really went through a long period of time before they started to grasp the the what was good about natives and how to plant it correctly and that same thing went through and there was a time we used to plant 15 pounds of switchgrass an acre in this state now we plant it at the most on its own four pounds and if it's in a wow. mix you know a half a pound and and so you know it's just been a a maturing process where we've learned about about natives and and reestablishing them so uh there has been a big change but the pinnacle has been the pollinator program it was kind of interesting because iowa got thrown into it head first cp42 right? cp42 the pollinator and when when it all happened when we started to realize that we were losing our wild our pollinator populations out there whether it was bugs or birds or bats or whatever it happened to be uh, butterflies. Well, the big one turned out to be the, the monarch butterfly. I kidded with you guys off off mic, but you know this little couple gram freaking critter, you know, could affect agriculture more than anything else has in the history of the country. Uh, and and what I learned about it is it's one of those things that you should know about, but nobody really knows the whole cycle of what happens with monarchs and how they how they migrate and how many lifespans it takes to complete the migration. But when you figure, when you start reading about it and learn about it, I'm just one of the most incredible species on the planet. You know, I, I learned later that there's, there's pollinators, there's monarch like butterflies, even over in, you know, Eastern Europe and in Europe and in Africa that do the same, same kind of thing. And it's, I'm like, you know, what the heck? 
how, how do you find the little spot in Mexico after you've died two times? And finally, your great grandkid lives. I mean, that's amazing. It's, it's kind of goofy, but I mean, it's all, it's almost like that. So it's, so CP42 was developed and, you know, every, it went completely out of bounds where we changed our mixes, you know, from a lot of grasses and a few forbs to now it's a lot of forbs and a few grasses. And, uh, from a pheasant standpoint and from a quail standpoint, it's the best thing you can plant out there doesn't have to be the whole field but what we saw in Iowa is in when this all kind of exploded there's a bunch of people that were coming on a CRP and it was the only program available you know if you were going to go back in you had to do you had to do pollinators now originally those were thought to be maybe 20 acre fields you know at the most and now we've got 300 and 400 and 100 acre fields all over the state it's all pollinator and I'm telling you they're doing fine it's a big shakeup because you know, it's a different look out there the first couple of years. I always say, you know, you're planting, you know, a tenth of a pound of big blue stem per acre. I mean, it's not that long ago we're planting three pounds per acre, you know, in mixes. And, and, and now it's a tenth of a pound, but it's, it's still doing well. It's all about the stem density and the ability to move underneath and work around underneath and, and to have that greenery and that broadleaf plants in there that attract everything. I think it's as good for deer as it is for pheasants. You know, you'd like to have more cover out there, but there's nothing wrong with it. They may not be using it when they use big, heavy stands of CP25. It's got a lot of grass in it, but they're using it at night and they're using it, you know, at other times of the day and it's, and it's critical habitat from that standpoint. From a pheasant standpoint, it's nuts. I mean, I can't, I, I, I'm a pheasant hunter and I go out and at one spot, I'll, uh, I drive west a lot and I'll stop out by, uh, Bussy Lake, uh, the big lake up by Fort Dodge, the one that we put in. Um, God, I'll remember it. But anyhow, big public area, you know, thousands of acres of public ground. And you can go through and you can hunt a big field, a big blue stem, you can hunt a switchgrass patch. You walk into that dang pollinator patch, it feels like every bird in the country is in the dang thing. And I think they just like that overhead cover. It's almost like it's loafing ground as well as grasslands. I think as these things mature, they're going to get even better because there'll be a little more grass component in them as the years go by. But it's that forb component that makes the world go round on those, on those birds. Yeah. And I think it's just, you know, it was a huge step for USDA and I really take my hat off to them, but I think it was a lot of people, a lot of other partners talking about it that made them take that step. And we got a, we got a hell of a thing out there, CP42. Interesting. Um... Another thing offline that we kind of were alluding to is how close we were to losing uh, upland birds, yeah. pheasant specifically in the state. So of why is all this stuff important? Because we need to, even in the bad years, we got to maintain a decent population of pheasants. And it's changed so much since I was a kid. You know, we used to, when we first started putting in those switchgrass fields, there were people who, you know, back in the late 80s, and early 90s and there wasn't even all, all around the state you know there was just some counties that kind of grasped it and and saw they could be planted and they would promote it a little bit um and you'd go in there and it'd just be nuts you know just pheasants everywhere especially you know at this time of year where you get a wet snow and everything else is not worth a dang and those switchgrass fields would still be standing and there'd be a ton of birds in them and that's great uh but we had other habitat around. We had fence rows that came into those places. Over the years, our habitat continually gets fragmented. So 2014, 2013, crop prices start going up. You guys lived in Southern Iowa. You saw the destruction that happened. Everybody was looking for more acres. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's just that it's fragmenting our overall habitat. And you go out to public area, you can find a 40 acre public area now and you know that thing's blown out in two weeks after the opener of pheasant season but you see some of these public areas that are three four eight hundred thousand acres and you can hunt them all year round and you can always be chasing birds in them so those places as our as our habitat fragments those bigger areas are more important bigger bigger areas are where we're going to be able to sustain and keep a sustainable pheasant population um and then we saw it, we actually saw it here in Iowa in 2011. I get my years a little mixed up. It was like 2011 when 
we saw our pheasant population. That wasn't the dry, it was wet, and our pheasant population tanked. We killed 150,000 birds in the state. You know, 12 years earlier or so, we were killing 1.5 to 1.8 million birds. 150,000 wow. birds. Now, what's scary about that is that it follows the same things that happened in Michigan, in Northwest Ohio, in Pennsylvania. And what was happening is habitat got fragmented down enough so that the pheasant population got so low that even if PIC, remember PIC, the, the one-year set-aside programs that we had for a while in our late 70s, early 80s, uh, early 80s, uh, you know, if you, all of a sudden a bunch of grassland comes in, there's not enough birds to let that population grow exponentially. And what they'd say is, here, we could do that. When you look at those areas, it was going to take five years just to get back to a population where you could explode. You're seeing the effects of 2011, 2012 in Southern Iowa today from that happening back, you know, seven, eight years ago. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, Joel and I have gone and not road hunted, but drove around and we've seen some pheasant around here. But, uh, and it's next to some big, big CRP fields. Yeah. But I would say right around where I, where I'm at. So we have a lot of cattle farm we have cattle and then we have farmers all around my property i i haven't heard a pheasant in at least a year and I'm, i don't hear quail yeah yeah well there's another culprit in this whole thing too and that's trees you know you don't never <laughs> notice it. trees are your your my raccoons are your, tr your trees well is that, is that you know the thing that's crazy about that is that i used to get so ticked off working in south dakota and Fish and Wildlife Service would be so wound up about trees, you know, cut all the trees down. Oh my God, give me a break, you know. I used, to, I was, I was 100% the other way, because we were looking in northern, north, northern Iowa, and some of those shelter belts, you know, were important places for pheasants in winter, in the winter time. And my thing was, it's not trees, it's having the trees in the right place, and that's partially correct. But it, I'm talking about southern Iowa. There's a couple things to remember. We're bouncing around a little bit here, but that's okay. Uh, because I'm on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember Southern Iowa when it was, when it was, you know, unbelievable. And what was happening then, you know, it was the, towards the end of the 70s, it was the end of the 70s and early 80s were starting up and farmers were expanding. And in North Iowa, that was hurting our pheasant population because what was left to expand was the last little bit of grassland habitat that was that was out there and we were becoming more fragmented. What happened here in Southern Iowa, that expansion actually caused a lot of, caused a lot of just, just, you know, a lot of, a lot of just, you know, plowing up ground, not getting it all take done and creating a lot of weedy spots, a lot of cornfields that never get harvested until the next spring. And we created a pheasant wonderland down here. So the expansion and the, you know, and just the effect that it had on the overall area and habitat actually made it a little better pheasant area and it blew up into where it was incredible. So we also were seeing a lot of people getting out of cattle. So those pastures that were, you know, that were being grazed in the ground back then were growing and growing wild and there's nothing wrong. Those places were providing nesting areas too for pheasants. The quail went, went gaga too. Or the quail would be solid up through that time, but you know, there was still a lot of quail also. But that expansion and, and, and work down here actually created it. If you look at Iowa, if you think of Iowa as having quail or pheasants, you know, first released or whenever the heck it was, it was around 1908 and there's different places where they were supposedly released. But, you know, by 1926, we have a pheasant season. And if you look at that 100 year or so, you know, more than that period, 100 year period, Southern Iowa was great for about 10 years in that period. Other parts of the state were fantastic. I'm not saying that Southern Iowa is not good pheasant habitat. I'm just saying that it's a tougher road down here than it is in other places. And one of the biggest things is just our trees. Think about, you know, think about the, the hedgerows, the Osage Orange hedge, hedgerows. You know, when I used to hunt down here, they were just Osage Orange hedgerows. Now you walk down them and there's elm 60 feet and there's, there's other stuff mixed in there and the Osage Orange is all going to hell. And, you know, they're, they're turned into just tree rows. And, you know, it was a great thing 
back there in the late 90s where we actually saw our forest land in Iowa actually start to expand, where it's always been shrinking. It was expanding, it was expanding because those old pastures are now growing up in trees. And every little slough that was once a slough was growing up in trees. And that's not good for pheasants. A great study out of Nebraska here recently where they showed nearly a 40% decrease in nesting. If there was a tree within, what the hell was it? I mean, it was like 100 yards. That's you know? interesting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, they don't like it. I mean, I tell people sometimes say, you know, where can I go to see great habitat in Iowa? And I push them towards Northwest Iowa up to, to, the, to the Prairie Pothole Joint Venture where we plant really diverse native stuff and they you know, burn it and keep it looking good. The other place I talk about is, is Grand River over at Mount Air. And some of the places that they're working for prairie chickens, which has just been a tough, you know, those poor prairie chickens just can't stand Iowa because of the dang trees. <laughs> but, you know, we had the hen a few years, and we always joke about it, that moved 1,600 miles in one year. I said, the poor thing, first we thought it was in, the collar got stuck in the gut of a coyote. Is what I thought <laughs> but uh, it wasn't. It was some poor hen. Uh, hen prairie chicken that would wake up every morning and start shaking because there were trees around so she'd go fly forever to try to and she basically wore out wore out and died you know I mean she just it just was too much for her but what they've done on the public areas down there in terms of clearing out the woody cover uh, is fantastic I wish we could it's a great example of what we'd like to see out there for really quality because it's turned into quality pheasant hunting and it's also not bad quail hunting down there too and just that disturbance and, and cleaning out trees. Uh, another good one is uh, the, the, the Neil Smith Prairie. You know, they, they, they spent a, God, a lot of money on it, but they've cleared a lot of, you know, tree uh, ravines and stuff out and have turned them back into prairie. And that open country looks a lot different than the rest of Iowa, but it's dang good pheasant country. Hmm. So I'm just saying in Southern Iowa, Clearing out those trees are important. I had a great, okay, another story. So I had a guy out of, out of Linn County, kind of a big businessman. He was mad in hell. And, and we're both from originally yeah. that area. Well, he, he was out of Cedar County. Rapids, and he was grouchier in hell at me about, uh, you know, no pheasants and let's kill all the predators and all that stuff. And, and uh, he says, I'm going to take you to a place that's, to show you what the hell real pheasant country is. And we went over into Jones County. Where the hell was it? Anyhow, it was along the Wapsi. And uh, I had the president of the chapter with me, and we were walking with him. And, you know, I'd been up in Bremer County along the Wapsi, and I knew what the Wapsi was like. And I had great hunting up there in the late 80s because it was a drought. But he, we walk in, and there, first off, there's a nice big grass field, you know, kind of in the watershed, but not right in the watershed. And it was, you know, there was stuff growing up all through it. You know, it needed a bullhog to go through and just clean everything the heck out. And, and then he said, and look at that tree row. When I was young, we'd walk that thing and shoot our limit every single day. What well, was 60 foot Nor Norway spruce? It was nothing but, it was all habitat, you know? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that, but it wasn't pheasant habitat. And he's old enough where he knew when it was young and he's looking at it. Well, the best part is we came up over a dike and we go out and we look at this 60 acres, whatever, of reeds canary grass. Wapsy well, bottoms, reed canary grass. He goes, now that's is where they used to nest, you know? And we walked down over and the poor president of the chapter was going to work that morning, but he had his good clothes on. He stepped in and it was six inches of water underneath that uh, reef where the, the wapsie come up and, you know, it's, it's, just, flooded it. it's just changing habitat. And I look at places that I hunted when I was a kid and go back now and go, that's not what it was when we went through that thing. And it's a slow process, but as things change, you know, Things you know, change. Turkeys don't eat pheasant chicks, for God's sakes. The turkeys are there because the trees, because the trees are there. It's the trees that ate the dang pheasant chicks. Well, we've asked everyone else the same question. Let's let's stay on the topic because you brought it up. So <clears throat> there is this. Uh, there are some people that believe that there's a correlation between wild turkeys and pheasants. Yeah. And in the sense that wild turkeys. Uh, will kill pheasants or eat their eggs or kill the little ones or whatever. Is there any validity to that? Or have you ever heard that? Have you heard it? <laughs> Jesus God! Have you had a nickel? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, they, they have a direct correlation. Turkeys like trees and pheasants like grasslands. And as the trees increase, the turkeys are going to increase. Now, 
you can go way back to where we were kind of screwed up on turkeys when we started. We thought, you know, local range was 10,000 acres and never even come back in Iowa. That ain't true. And, and we learned that real quick. But the other thing is, is that, that that's the correlation. It's trees. And as better forest habitat increases, turkeys are going to go up and pheasants may go down if there's not big enough grasslands around there just to good nesting habitat for those pheasants. But they're not, ki- or they're not killing I don't think other. they are. You know, I ain't saying that. I suppose a turkey might eat a dang pheasant chick if one walks up to it or something. Who knows? But it's not, it's not a correlation. I mean, it's... So you're it's saying life it's and times in the big forest or whatever. It's just the visibility of the change in the habitat. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. There's no reason to say, oh by God, they're eating the pheasants. Because what the hell was where was I? God. I heard the same thing. I heard the same thing on another critter, and I can't think of what it No, it wasn't. It was turkeys. It was turkeys in northern Wisconsin eating freaking grouse. You know, they, they, what they've done up there is they've expanded up as, as corns move north and more agriculture is up there. There's, they can get through the winter up there. And there's turkeys all over northern Wisconsin now. And and what do you guess? They're eating the grouse. I don't know. Poor turkeys. Not for Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be be safe, safe, have have fun, fun, and and get get outdoors. outdoors.